Well, for the second time, I welcome Lynette Zhang onto uh, uh, my channel. Uh, very popular last time she was on. Um, of course, everybody knows uh, that she is uh, an I am uh, bullion bugs, if you will, or gold bugs, call them what you like. Uh, so we do tend to sing off the same hymn sheet when it comes to a lot of matters. But I thought it would be very useful for my subscribers uh, and perhaps Lynette's subscribers, if I add a bit of whatever's happening in England uh, at the moment, if she would like to know. Um, uh, what's what's happening? We know an election's coming up. Uh, we know it's Trump versus Kamala Harris, which I would regard from an economic perspective, especially as an Austrian school economist, that's a pretty poor choice. Uh, but anyway, there we are. Uh, and like us, you vote red or blue, and you... <laughs> You get whatever Muppet turns up with a red or blue label. It's uh, it's where we're joined at the hip uh, in these matters with the United States. So Lynette's going to give us her take uh, on what's going on at the moment, what might happen, uh, and we'll go right round the houses. Uh, nothing's off the table. Uh, so uh, I'm going to sort of really see if I can squeeze her brain for everything that's going on. Uh, and uh, we all might learn something to our advantage even if it's just go and dig a hole in the garden and bury ourselves. So, okay, Lynette. Well, you know, first of all, I don't think that anybody should go dig a hole in the yeah. in the ground and bury themselves. I think that there are always opportunities in crisis. And um, I'm, I'm actually not a bullion uh, person because in the U.S., gold has been confiscated three times historically. So... In order to protect my wealth, I prefer the collectible coins, and there are all sorts of, of, of levels to that. But when you're looking at what's happening politically, whether it's in the UK or it's here in the US or frankly anywhere around the world, the choices that we have are really indicative of the end of its currency's life cycle. You know, we were talking for a second and I was in England. I went, I had a semester in England back in, that would have been like 75. And at that point, President Nixon then was, uh, he took us off the gold standard. But I remember all the questions that we were asked. And, and again, I think whoever is running for president or whoever is getting in right now, it's indicative that we have to shift from this current debt-based system that just prints money willy-nilly to support the spending uh, and the deficit spending is really what it is of the government because, because they are unable to generate enough, enough tax revenue to pay for what they're spending. So they have to just print more money because when you're talking about politics, it's all about promises right? They're going to promise to lower the taxes over here. They're going to promise to give away all of these freebies over there. But there is no such thing as a free lunch. And freedom is not free. That's why it is critically important that we all become our own central bankers, whether it's in gold or silver or both i i do a combination of the two for different reasons but um yeah politically frankly i don't think it really matters who gets elected because i've done enough studies on laws that are on the books and when you go back in the u.s it's the republicans or the democrats didn't matter who was in office an agenda was being pushed forward by both parties so I'm not going to sit here and say one of our uh, one of our candidates are going to be better or worse than the other. They're, it doesn't matter. We're, we're at the end of this currency's life cycle, and we just have to accept that and get into position. And that's where the sound money, the gold and the silver comes in, because the only tool they have left is more of this. And we know that every time they do that, the value of what's out there declines. And we see that as inflation. And when they talk about politicians, when they talk about getting the inflation under control, 
all they're really talking about is controlling the rate speed of inflation. And with this Fed pivot that's coming up, whether it's a half a basis point, or or whether it's it's 50 basis points or a quarter of a basis point, that's just a more of an excuse to take on more debt and print more money for the corporations or the people. Because if you know you're going bankrupt and you get a credit card in the mail, most people will just go ahead and max that credit card out because they already know what's happening. And that's what I see. But what I find particularly interesting is this massive global rush to issue debt at these interest rate levels when what they anticipate, what corporations and, and people are anticipating is that the central banks on a global basis again, from, in most places, are going to be dropping the interest rates. So I don't know. Godfrey, what do you think about why would these corporations be taking out more debt at a higher interest rate when they anticipate a lower interest rate? Well, do you, do you ever see any of Alistair McLeod's work at all uh, over there? He's And I have a lot of respect for him. In fact, we're going to be doing an event together in Australia in November. Oh, really? You'll find him great fun. Um, his, his view... Uh, and I've worked alongside Alistair uh, on a lot of occasions. You know, we're, we're, we're actually good chums. Um, and that is his view, as you know, is that they can't they can't lower interest rates. They can't not lower interest rates because they've dug themselves into such a hole. Um, and so everybody's expecting, I think, it's built in that there will be a rate cut. Uh, and Alistair's view is, and it's an interesting view, and I sympathize with that view, is that uh, how will you get away your government debt or the United States government debt? And incidentally, Great Britain is in exactly the same situation, but that's a subject for another day. Um, how will they get away their debt uh, unless there's a coupon uh, on T-bills and things which is worthy of the risk to the capital? And of course, the capital risk now uh, is high. And of course, if we go back, an old man like me goes back to, uh, you know, the 1960s when I went into the city of London, uh, you wouldn't regard uh, a capital uh, uh, risk uh, of American uh, bills, uh, government bills, sovereign debt. You just wouldn't remember. And of course, as you say, in uh, 1971, Nixon came off the gold window, as it were. He came, he came off gold standard. And of course, that's when it went, all went wrong that they were talking about. That's it. That's it. Thank you for thank you for saying that. Because I I was I misspoke. It was Watergate that everybody was talking about that controversy. That's right. That's right. I was so uh the question is, I don't know. I if if we were looking for somebody very clever, you might say, gosh, people are buying them uh if people are buying them now because they know there'll be a dip but they will have to go to seven or eight or nine in the future. So they might think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good call if they can lock in something on the short term. And I think I'm right in saying most of the, I think most bonds are being bought at the moment are short term bonds. Would I be right in thinking that? Would be right in thinking that, but I wasn't really referring to them people buying them to lock in those higher rates. I'm talking about this mad rush that I'm seeing really on a global basis of corporations issuing debt because they have to roll. I know that part of it is they have to roll that debt over and they don't have any choice, but it also looks like you've got a lot of corporations that would appear to be sound that are issuing and governments of course but the corporations that are issuing debt that means they have to pay that higher coupon so why in the world would they issue debt unless they had to roll it over 
because they were going to default on it. Why would they? Why would they accept having to pay more for that debt when, in the shorter term, we will see governments, central banks, lowering that interest rate? Well, I think they're debt junk. Surely they are. They have become, as it, is, it has done uh, uh, in, in 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 England as well. They are debt junkies. Uh, yes. So. They're not making a rational decision that they're going to do this. or that. They know they're in the end game. And what they're going to try and do, perhaps, I don't know, is to kick it down the road for another year. So it doesn't go wrong on their watch. That would be my take. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I'm not that, you know, the assumption always is. And I think that this is interesting, but I'm not sure that it's accurate. Accurate. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But. The thought is that they always want to kick the can down the road, but you do still get to the end of the road. So I think that they they only want to kick the can down the road long enough to have the next iteration of the new money in place before they then go up oh, too expensive, we're done, and then a major crisis of confidence happens. And that's really what you were talking about. And I think we might've been talking about this before this inter interview, where people in general are not flocking to the safety of gold because they still have confidence in this stuff. And that is to their detriment because you could have a trillion dollars or but or a trillion pounds. But if you can't buy anything with it, a trillion times zero is still zero. And, you know, as you and I were talking, you know, I am finding that there is also this underlying global movement on the public, especially the younger public that are buying gold in the US. That's witnessed by companies like Walmart, Amazon, um, was there was one other Costco. one, which one? Costco. Costco, right? Which are huge retailers here. They're just big box stores. Yes, and I know them. Out of their of their silver and gold. First of all, they're only buying it and holding it and selling it because the demand is there. So, I think we're in a very interesting dichotomy right now where the public is growing more aware, but you're not really hearing very much about it because it's not something that wants to be encouraged. And they control the spot markets, spot silver, spot gold. It's easy to control them because they don't have to have the physical gold or the physical silver. They just use a contract and create a whole bunch of gold and silver that does not nor ever will exist to suppress the price to keep everything calm so that people stay in this system which makes it so much easier for them to transfer your wealth away from you to the big guys the big corporations because going back to all of that debt or even insurance policies or any of that, they all run counterparty risk. But people well, don't really. Well, certainly there's a couple of, you've raised a couple of interesting points there. Firstly, one is historical. And if you go back to the sort of the definitive historical uh, 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 template, if you like, which is the uh, Weimar Republic, Yep. Uh, and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the same time, and the Reichsmark, of course, uh, went. You know, we all know, as every schoolboy used to know, they don't know now because they've degraded education. Uh, but we used to know that, of course, uh, the the mark. You know, they were bringing it in wheelbarrows. But what was interesting, uh, if you look at the history uh, and the translations from the German, uh, uh, also very interesting. It was. It was really ages and ages before the public actually realized what was happening to their currency they they didn't get it right until they were uh, they were selling their 
works of art and they you could get for the United States dollars then or even at the French franc which of course was gold backed in those days you could buy very good pieces of property for not very much but the general public still didn't get it and we still uh, know here uh, in in England and the universities and the schools and all the rest of it they don't teach real economics they teach what we would have regarded as Keynesian economy, economics or what they call now modern monetary theory. And I still get um, responses to my uh, podcasts and stuff. The people say, oh, it doesn't matter. To, to, who do we owe all this money to? And, of course, they don't understand. It's their own pension fund. It's their own life insurance companies uh, and so on and so forth. So if it all goes down, their life insurance company won't pay out. Their pension will disappear. But such is the standard of education here, and I suspect I have to say the United States as well, they simply don't get it because it's quite deliberate they don't get it. So that's one point I'd like you to comment on. And the second is, um, of course, the casino, if you will, of futures and the comics and so on and so forth. People now, or the East, or some of the central banks, the East, some of the sharp guys, uh, which aren't in the Western Hemisphere, um, some of the sharp guys are standing for delivery now. People aren't saying, no, I don't want dollars. I want you to deliver it. And particularly true of what is now becoming more difficult to get and probably even more difficult is going to be silver. Uh, so if you've got silver dollars or silver Britannias, as we have here, that is also going to be uh, because uh, I welcome your comments on silver because the price of silver at the moment, historically, is completely and totally out of kilter. But again, my subscribers, and I suspect a lot of yours, will be of what you might call the artisan class. They've worked hard all their lives. And they've got a bit of savings and they're not stupid uh, like the English middle class who are, as a genre, I have to tell you, unbelievably stupid people. Uh, but your average worker, you know, your chippy, uh, your electrician, he knows how many bees make five. He doesn't do finance. He doesn't do finance. Uh, but he can do all sorts of stuff I can't do. I can't put a shelf up me. I'm hopeless. Uh, so what you've got is these guys um, saying, you know, what do I do? Uh, and um, uh, we're, by the way, we're with you on that in coinage. You know, we're coinage. when I say bullion, we have to buy bullion in our pension funds. For some reason, the authorities don't let us buy a coin. But if if you want you want coins because they're coin of the realm in in, in this country. Twenty no no VAT. No sales tax, if you like, and no capital gains tax, uh, and so on and so on. So, yes, yeah, got to be coins. But, yeah, tell me tell me uh, how how your people are going about it. I'm, it's interesting that uh, your retail market is starting to pick up, but it's still, I would argue, quite a long way from where it should be. Oh, well, absolutely. And and because of the easy manipulation of the spot markets, you know, it's it's so interesting because every time the stock market goes down, the spot gold market also gets whacked. And that's because of all of the leverage and the borrowing to buy these stocks and push these prices up. Um, so overall, I would say most people are completely unaware, but when they created this, John Maynard Keynes, that's why we have Keynesian economics. He knew two key things. Number one, people marry the legal money of the state and they cannot but help but think that at some point it will regain some of its purchasing power, which it never, ever, ever, ever does. And then he also knew that not one man in a million understands inflation and so by design in Keynesian economics, you know, when you when you sell debt, you have that coupon like we were talking about. So there's interest on that debt. And so by design, inflation was baked into it. And, and, and so was the dumbing down of the public and the erosion in the quality of food. Now you have better quality in, in Great Britain and, you know, in the UK than we do here in the US with all the GMO and all of that garbage. But I've read the documentation when they were creating this. And there were two things they wanted to accomplish. One was to be able for the government to tax the public without them realizing it and without having to go to Congress for approval. That's inflation. That's the inflation tax. 
but the other one was for corporations because they wanted to pay people less and less and less. But if you were used to getting 10 pounds, you're not gonna accept five. But if we can make that 10 pounds spend like five, they got what they wanted. And so this whole system was set up by corporations and the government. And of course they don't want us to understand how money is created and supported inside of the system because the support is just about what central bankers call price stability. Now you and I would think, well, that means that that gallon of milk stays the same price. That's a stable price. But what they're actually referring to, central banks are referring to, is if they can keep it, keeping the, the inflation down at like 2%, then they're getting those price increases, but we, the public, don't change our habits. We don't ask for more money, right, from our employers, and we don't change how we spend that money Rather, people just take on more and more and more debt. But whether you're a government, a corporation, or an individual, at some point, you have to pay the piper on that debt. And quite honestly, Godfrey, I believe that the piper is calling in all of the chips. And that from what I'm seeing in, in different technical areas, that the end game is already begun, but kind of like an iceberg. All we and the public sees is the teeny weeny tip. The danger really lies in what's beneath the surface that we cannot see because it's opaque, intentionally opaque. So where you were referring to the futures, hey, go on the CME put in their central bank program. You know, everybody is in there, whether it's the commercial banks or the central banks that are playing with these markets to keep the public naive so that we have to work harder and harder and harder just to try and sustain a standard of living. And we can't. Those debt levels are ginormous and the default rate, at least here in the US, is, is starting to spike. So what we have going on, this is the importance of having sound money that's used in every single sector of the global economy, no matter where you are. And something really interesting because everybody refers back to the Weimar Republic, but then if you're talking to like a normal person, they go, oh, well, that was there and that was then and this is now and this time is different because they always want you to think this time is different. But there are a number of currencies in Ethiopia, in, in Egypt, in, in Nigeria, in South America, you know, on and on and on that are doing overnight currency revaluations. And what's been super eye-opening to me and I'll do a piece on this, but anybody can do this. Go to any currency converter and, and pull up the current currencies that are resetting. Pull up the Zimbabwean dollar, or you can't even find Zig Gold yet in normal currency converters. No. Going by the old Zimbabwe dollar. But what you're going to see and it's so fascinating and anybody can do it. Now, obviously I live in the US, so I use the US dollar, but you could use the British pound and, I, and I'm, I'm really certain you're gonna find the same thing, that whatever currency is doing the overnight revaluation, I don't care which one you pick, you find that the US dollar to that currency goes up dramatically overnight, because these are overnight revaluations. But if you put in spot silver, guess what? Spot silver outperforms the US dollar against those currencies. Spot gold outperforms spot silver in those other currencies. Take your pick. I'm not telling you do this one or do that one. Pick any overnight revaluation within the last six months 
because there's been lots that you can look at. So are you really better off by converting to another government's fiat currency or are you better off holding physical silver and physical gold? And I think I'm going to be hammering that home a whole lot more because I just recently, in fact, I don't even know that it's out yet, but I just recently did one on food inflation because the governments around the world want people to think that they now have control of this inflation. And who would have known that printing all this money would have created all that inflation? I mean, really? However, <laughs> that drives me crazy. However, when you are looking at even the current spot price, because spot gold uh, has, out, has outperformed in terms of all those other currencies more than they have in the US. But we've even had a breakout here, even inside of the spot markets. So if we could get people just to go on and do that little currency conversion for themselves and see that gold and silver, even though it's well below its true value at this point, because that's where it goes to, when they do those overnight resets, and not the first time they do it, but that's where it starts to add to. Seriously, gold outperforms everything. Silver maintains your ability to buy the same, say example, the same food basket. But gold puts you in a position to buy those income producing assets during this next crisis. And that's the opportunity that I see for everybody around the world. There was certainly a great opportunity in the Weimar Republic, but we've got that opportunity ahead, ahead of us. And that's exciting to me. It's interesting, isn't it, uh, talking about the Weimar Republic, because people could go to the French franc then, uh, or the dollar, or even the pound sterling, although we came off the gold standard a, a little bit later. But leaving that aside, um, there was somewhere to run to. Now, I would argue in the West, there's nowhere to run to now for fiat currency because even the Swiss franc, if you if you track the Swiss franc from 1971, it's been less disastrous than anything else. But it's still been disastrous. I mean, that's sort of fallen to its purchasing power, something like about whatever it is. Uh, I don't know, probably 20 cents or something like that. The dollar's gone to nine, nine or eight or nine cents. The pound sterling's three. Is it three now? Yeah. Uh, so now here's a point. Uh, it's a diff quite a difficult question, perhaps. Um, I did spend, I'm a city fund manager or was a city fund manager in the city of London with, with a very big organization, but managing fixed interest in point of fact. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. So that's my sort of background. Um, but I had 10 years in politics at the European Parliament Um I was fascinated having come from a fairly hot shot investment bank and, you know, round about 45, whatever it was, 50, decided to have a bit of a change, do something different. Um, so I went into politics, got elected to my great surprise um, as an independent, basically, uh, not as a party hack. Um, <laughs> now, when I got in and I got to the tables and I met ministers and I met people, uh, quite senior people in, 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 in the political sphere and the civil service sphere, uh, sphere i was possibly stunned how stupid they all were now yeah. i know there's some very clever people m manipulating things behind the scenes there's some very clever people manipulating back but your average politician is no. incredibly stupid fascinatingly stupid um and your more gene more junior civil servant or your medium ranking civil servant is also now, he wasn't 30 or 40 years ago in this country. He's now also extremely stupid and moreover politicized, yes. politicized. Uh, and when I go to the United States, I smell the same kind of thing, although I don't live there. And it's difficult to get a view if you don't live in a place. Visiting's not the same. Well, is that, would that be the same? Would you go with that? A hundred percent. I mean, it, it, it's just incredible when I listen to the debates, I just shake my head because I know they have no clue. And when I listen to even, 
you know, even CNBC or Bloomberg or these talking heads that are supposed to be so knowledgeable. No, I, I'm right there with you that I, people have absolutely no clue yet. And it's hard to find in other countries, but in the US, you can go to the Federal Reserve Education Department, it's called the FRED, and you can put in in the search bar, purchasing power of the consumer dollar. And even though I know that they, you know, jury rig numbers to make it look the way they want it to look, it's miserable. And there's a big fat zero on that chart, which is what happens. Gosh, I mean, there's over 4,800 currencies, you know, and, and this is even a monopoly money that I put into all these other currencies that do not exist anymore. What's the difference between this and any of these? So people trust these because the government can tax you and spend and print money, the central banks can support the printing of money and it hurts all of us. It hurts every single person. Why do, I mean, I would, as an Austrian school economist, I would not support the idea of uh, putting your money, tax money into in, in infrastructures. I don't believe in that system. I believe in virtually no taxation at all, which I believe is theft and let everybody get on with their own lives and it will all sort itself out. That would be my view. But there's a strong view, of course, that government spending, and it was Keynesian, if you like, that put, spending money, the government spending money uh, puts money into the economy. And I argue, of course, I would, wouldn't I, that if the government spending money takes it out of the economy. But even if you don't go down that rabbit hole, why would you send billions and billions of dollars uh, in America to the Ukraine, for example, uh, and war after war, and I know the industrial military complex in America, ever since Eisenhower made his observations, is grotesque. There's no other word for it. Um, so he sort of flagged that up. And here, of course, it's welfare. In our country, it's welfare. Uh, everybody, everybody either works in the public sector, uh, whose indexing salaries and pensions go with it, don't do, do very much work, and welfare. So all you have to do you don't have to prove you need any welfare because you can't work. You just go, oh, I'm tired. I'm pissed off. You know, and that, oh, that's right. You can sign here and you get the dough. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse. So we have all these problems. And nobody seems to. And I worked in Hong Kong for a while. I worked in Hong Kong. The idea that you would actually, the government would pay somebody not to work if they weren't disabled is extraordinary. They still don't really get it. You get up, you work. If you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, it's, that isn't difficult, is it? And so this is the sort of problem that we have. They're not building the roads. They're not building the infrastructure. It's disappearing abroad. And we send, I tell you the latest thing we've got over here, we've committed 100 billion uh, pounds to Africa to stop the sun shining. You couldn't invent all this. I mean, you really, really couldn't invent all this. But our politicians are incredibly stupid. And of course, there's no change. We've got a new guy in now who's a nutcase. The last guy was a nutcase. And the, and the guy before him was a nutcase. Nobody's actually, and everybody goes into a, a, an election, and I suspect it will be the same in uh, uh, coming up now to your election. Everybody boasts not how much they're going to save on spending, but how much more they're going to spend. You know, it's always more. Tell you what, if you vote for us, we'll spend more. And they should be saying, vote for us and we'll cut the debt. We'll cut this and we'll cut that. And that will be make, 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 more, uh, make more sense to the average person. And your, your Californian bank, what's the name of the Californian bank that went under last year? So, I, can't, I can't remember. Um, and so there were, there were uh, a number of them, but yeah. I think it started with SBB. Yeah, that's right. Now, what is an interesting, I much uh, uh, look forward to your comments on this. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, one of my uh, hypotheses, if it will, that the first, the banks would start to go down when they were caught with derivatives. And there's billions and billions of dollars of derivatives, which would suddenly come home to roost. And that is still my, uh, that's still my view. But I'm right, am I not, in thinking that that thing went down, it was holding government debt. If you actually looked at the books as an auditor, you'd go, this bank is sound. It was only when a massive capital uh, fall of the value 
of bonds and of course gilts would be the same here for the same reasons suddenly you've got a bank that go that's not gambled on derivatives it's got what you think is absolutely stop they should have had gold in the vaults of course if they had gold in the vaults they'd have been a lot better off they'd still be in trade today Nobody seems to get this. And I've lectured at banks, you know, I've le lectured at big banking seminars. And I, they stare at me, you know, they stare. They don't get it. Yes. They're quite senior bankers. They don't know anything about banking either. You know, we seem to be surrounded by these people who just don't know anything. How do they get there? Well, they get there with all of those promises. <laughs> you know, they promise the world and people, I don't know why anybody thinks that there's something such as a free lunch, because there never is anything such as a free lunch. But, you know, I, I, I mean, this is something that didn't suddenly happen. The erosion, if, if you go back to when they first started this system in the U.S. with the Federal Reserve, they say that if they have to work more time to maintain a standard of living, they will have less time to pay attention to what we're doing. And we've been, we've been extremely dumbed down. I am with you. I talked to some very brilliant people, people that I absolutely have the utmost respect for and, and still do. And I'll say, but what happens when we get to zero in terms of purchasing power? And what I get back from them is, oh, well, yeah, 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 we know about that. We just don't talk about it. But that's the problem. The problem is the currency life cycle issue because everything, everything, everything has a life cycle. You know, I'm going to be 70 years old in another month and I have a nine-year-old granddaughter. I guarantee you, if you're looking at her, you're not going, gee, I wonder if she's going to be 70 next month. And if you're looking at me, you're not going to go, gee, I wonder if she's going to be 10 next month, right? Well, currencies are no different. So when you're talking about the wars, or you're talking about the derivatives, when you're talking about all of this, it, it's not so much the derivatives because that's sort of a, as a speculative trade is a newer kind of concept than historically. But there are patterns that we see every single time. And I see them in spades right now. Inflation, stock market implosions, the rise of geopolitical risk. You know, you ask me why the US would send funds to Ukraine. It's a proxy war, right? So you've got the US is really battling China on not just that front, but we've also got Taiwan. Right. We're looking at the hotbed in the Middle East, but these are all distractions. Civil rights are another one. Right. I mean, there are so many patterns that that really happen around a currency life cycle issue. The same as in 1971, when to your point, and that was accurate, Nixon took us off the gold standard. I didn't understand that at that point. I was like, what, 17 years old, something like that? Mm. You know, so, and even I learned so much from listening to my parents and my and my aunts and uncles when they would get together for penny ante poker on Friday night and talk about the depression and talk about their experiences. Because I liked hearing those stories. I learned so much from them and they were brilliant. My Uncle Al had at least 3,000 ounces of gold in pre-33 form when it was illegal to hold more than five ounces in any other way and especially without any oversight. So, you know, there is, he was, they were pretty smart and they, I learned a lot from them, but they didn't understand what was really happening when President Nixon handed over what that really was, was handing over full control of inflation to unelected officials and the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor do they hold reserves. But if you know you're going bankrupt, why not spend all of that money? If, if you had one candidate that's promising the moon and you have another one that's saying, you know, we need to cut back. 
So that's why they just keep promising giving away and they have no idea that this is the end of this grand experiment, but they know that they want to move us into CBDCs where their words, not mine, central bank's words, we can have the finger on the button of interest rates are what they're talking about 24 seven and therefore control the economy, but what they're really saying, control the population 24-7. This is a consumer-driven global economy. Even in China, they've been working on, on boosting those consumers. Well, consumers can only consume if they have the ability to get more debt until they have to pay it off and they can't pay it off or they have to earn more money. But the value that's out there, I mean, part of the strategy is repaying fixed rate debt with dollars in this country that have no value because we do have an advantage here and that you can lock in a mortgage for 15 years or for 10 or for 30 years. Whereas in most of the rest of the world, I think you have a limited amount of time and then your mortgage rolls over to whatever that interest rate is. But these consumers, once they can no longer consume, what's going to support all of the, the stock markets and all of the bond markets? And goodness gracious, when you're talking about the banks, I love to use the sterling silver chopstick. 92 and half percent pure. So a foundation of money, interest rates, market value of bonds, right? Well, in this 40 year trend cycle, they kept every time we would get into a rough patch, they wanted to print more money and, and create inflation. They just pushed those interest rates down. I don't know if you can see this, but. Yes, I could not get the point, yep. Yep, okay. So then the market value of those bonds have gone up. And then even if you have more defaults, if you're in like a mutual fund or something that clumps them together, that hides what's actually happening beneath the surface. But then when you had the global central banks ratchet interest rates up super quickly, then all of that government debt for 15 years, they held it at zero or near zero. All of that debt means that that bank is insolvent. But every single one of them passed the, in the U.S. here, the stress tests, which is a joke because so much of what they have in those stress tests are opaque. And even the banks themselves, like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, so the large commercial banks say that the Fed is showing less loss than they're even doing with their inter internal risk models. So nobody knows how they come up with it. But what they do know is that if they pass, they can send out gains, which most of their gains are from trading revenues. I mean, you were in that industry. How much of your gains were in the banking sector back in the 70s were from trading? But today it's they on it. It's, 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 it's an interesting phenomenon, really, because, uh, as I say, uh, bankers don't really get it. Um, and, of course, the, now the derivative market is so much bigger than they were when I started. And, uh, and people don't understand what they've got. People don't understand what their own risk is. And I spoke to a very young merchant banker in uh, the city just the other day at my club. There's a lot of young men there and enjoying a drink. And he said, you know, he said to me, uh, I'm a bit of a Dutch uncle at the club. You know, they say, they say, they said, oh, Godfrey, what's that? You know, I've, I've, I've left university. I've been at the bank, uh, you got a good bank, good name. I've been at the bank for two years now. And he said, I, I, I don't understand any of it. And moreover, my boss doesn't seem to understand anything either. He said, it's just a casino, really. And, and, and they hope that they'll get away with it. Um, and, and if they kick the can down the road a little bit, uh, and this is the problem that we have. But I, I made a speech in the European Parliament. I was on the Monetary Affairs Committee. I made the hypothesis that regulation, and most of the regulation in this country came in in the mid-1980s, and I was around in the city in those days. 
about 1986. Big Bang, we called it here. You probably know about it. Uh, and I said, I think regulation has been brought in to protect the banks. It's not to rein them back or make them do things something sensible. Because once you, you, can, you can pass your regulatory inspection very easily if you tick all the right boxes. And they'll go on passing the regulators ticking the boxes until they go down. And everybody will say, well, how did that happen? It's because you're much better having, and, and uh, most people couldn't understand this on my committee, because they're all stupid people anyway. Um, uh, do you can, uh, can imagine a parliamentary committee in Brussels, can't you? I mean, monster stupid. And I used to say to them, uh, what we would do better uh, would be to have no regulation and make caveat emptor play. So people had to think for themselves about this bank, this investment. Not a little note that it's regulated and it's past some regulatory thing. And they go for it. They have to think for themselves. And the analogy I use to undergraduates sometimes when I'm speaking to them um, is let's take the safety belt. You know, when you're driving along, you can't click, don't you? Put the safety belt on because it's going to make you safe. Uh, and you've got your automobile and you're driving along and you've got your seatbelt on. Um, wouldn't you drive more safely if there was a big rusty spike in the middle of the steering wheel pointing at your chest and you weren't allowed a seatbelt? Yes. Yes. You wouldn't tailgate. You wouldn't speed. You wouldn't drive here and drive there. You'd be really careful because you know you're going to die instantly. Now, of course, they turn the radio on, they've got the seatbelts, they've got the bags that come up if you're in it. They don't care. But they still die. Well, they don't understand that you still get to die if you smash up. It doesn't save your life. Much better to avoid the crash to start with. And I would have no regulation so that, and your directors of banks, the bank can't go down and you walk away. Having had 40 years of bonuses or 30 years of bonuses to your beach place in Malibu or wherever it happens to be. No, you go to Jokey. You go to jail because you've broken caveat emptor. You've broken the law of the land, not the regulations, the law of the land. And it, you'll have to prove that it wasn't theft or embezzlement, which, of course, a lot of what it is. And if you're taking monster bonuses with money that isn't really there, to me, that's embezzlement. And so, you know, you have to do your pokey. Uh, and I, I and until but we don't do that. Everybody walks away. The big banking crisis in two thousand eight. Hardly anybody went to jail, except no. in Iceland. Would you believe they went to jail in Iceland? Right. So what what is the risk? I mean, uh, the the fines that these big banks pay they've just become doing part of business, and. You know, to your point with the regulations, and what there were some changes in the regulations in 2019 and 2020, and all of this is in efforts to stimulate the economy by stimulating the bank. And now, what do we have here in the U.S.? Is a whole bunch of day trades, 24-hour trades, right? And we look at the markets and the volatility in the markets, and they say, I mean, I. If, if I didn't need my laptop so much, I probably would have thrown it out a window a number of times when I'm listening to what they say. But they're saying, but if you're a long-term investor, don't worry about it. Well, guess what? Wall Street is about trading. Absolutely every single asset. We think that we're, well, in the U.S., we're, we've been taught to think that it's a free market, so based on supply and demand, but that's not true because of all of the derivatives and all of the trading that's going on. You have Wall Street traders. You have traders in the U.K. You have traders around the world that are determining what you're going to pay for oil, what you're going to pay for water, what you're going to pay for everything. So this is not, you know, I'd like to see a free market. And to your point, if this really was, then when you make a mistake, your company goes down. But instead, our regulators, our governments, our central banks, they're not, they were not put into place, to your point, they were not put into place to protect the public. They were put into place to protect the banking sector. Of course. And, 
Exactly. And there, and no matter what, I mean, here in the U.S. with the Dodd-Frank endgame, which has been, you know, those were the regulations that, I don't know, this thick that they passed without reading. They didn't even actually institute so many things that were in there before they were summarily dismantled. And now part of it was the capital level that the bigger banks had to hold. And mind you, none of them have a living will that passed inspection, right? Not one. And yet they, they turned it down from 19 to 9% because of all of the big bank lobbying. It's the money that speaks. It's not what's in the best interest of anybody, any individuals, or certainly the public. We are just the right size to fail. Is it, was it always, was it ever thus, Lynette? Was it ever thus? Or are we, it you was. know, are we looking back and thinking perhaps years ago it was somehow different? I mean, go back to, I don't know, uh, your central bank started right, uh, nine, nine, um, 1913, I think, 1913. Uh, yeah. Ours in all really was after the Great War. Uh, it wasn't actually properly nationalized until after the second war but leaving that aside the principle is the same so the whole thing the whole thing is corrupt not understood secret um and everybody seems to be i don't know i would say that you it's impossible to get anywhere to the top in certainly in politics and i've seen it from the inside unless you are a sociopath you have to be a sociopath. Yes. You have to have just, you don't care what happens to anybody else. You're interested in number one and going up the greasy pole. And that's that's really how I see, uh, well, I hate to say this, really, but I, guess, I think it's almost worse in democratic, so-called democratic pol politics uh, than, than it is in an autocracy. Well, we're, we're in, oh God, I, I'm going to screw this up, but I think that the U.S., even though we're supposed to be a, people think about us as a democracy, we're not. We're, we've got, we're straddling both fences and we will go over to one side, unfortunately, um, because it's not, you know, why do we even really need all of these politicians because much as they talk about the blockchain and how great all of this is going to be, well, why can't the public actually vote directly on the topics? Why do we need all of this big, heavy government? And also, to your point, 1913, hmm, do you think it's a coincidence that we had a war. That's the first world war. War, war world war one. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So when you ask me, used to, was it different? Sure. Back in the day, you could walk in with a $20 gold coin to the bank and walk out with a $20 bill, or you could walk in with a $20 bill and pull the gold out of the system. If you did that, what gold does inside of a currency is it requires fiscal responsibility. There are limitations to how much debt and what, what governments can do. So when we were on a gold standard and you could pull the gold out of the system, the public had a whole lot more power. Because if you didn't like it, you walked into the bank and you pulled the gold out and that created restrictions around what they could do. That's why they had to take the gold away from the public back in 1933 in the U.S. But Nixon had to close that gold window because the U.S. was tasked with maintaining a stable dollar price to gold of $35 an ounce, and they weren't doing it because of the Korean War, because of the Vietnam War, and we were exporting inflation around the world and the rest of the world, even though the public couldn't pull the gold out of the system, the rest of the world still could. And there was a run, nobody ever talks about this, but I have all the data and the charts and everything. Mm -hmm. There was a run on the dollar in the 60s. 
Um, I think de Gaulle was famous for saying that they didn't trust the U.S. government, and because governments could still send in their dollars, which they were forced to hold to buy oil, we became the world reserve currency, blah, blah, blah. They had to, but they could still turn in their dollars and pull the gold out of our system, and they did it in droves, mm. so so that by 1971, we had less gold in deep storage than we did prior to the 33 confiscation. And had Nixon not made that choice, we would have no gold. And to be perfectly honest with you, even though we say we have all of this gold, it's never been audited. And you beat, there- yeah, you beat my you beat me to the next question. Is it there? Is it there? Why no audit? I refused to, they didn't even let the German government audit. They said, okay, we won't take it away. But obviously, one has to question whether it is actually there, which brings me to the final question, because your time is valuable. Um, Historically, you can see uh, warfare coming very often to avoid, if the ultimate take people's mind off their personal problems is to cr- create a war. And now the difference, of course, we have now in a even in a fake democracy, you have to bring people with you. You can't just do it. Now I'm certainly here in America, uh, in uh, in the United States, uh, United Kingdom, uh, and and I expect it's probably the same over there. Although I don't think uh, Americans think too much about these matters. Um, probably not. We 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 are have this. We have bought the general public in this country in the main, in the main, not all, probably 15 percent have not bought into the fact that for some reason, Putin is a really evil man. He woke up one morning for no reason whatsoever and invaded the Ukraine. That that is that is the that is the thinking. No Mm -hmm. dissent is allowed. We're not allowed RT, Russia Today. We're not allowed that in this country. They've taken the satellites or whatever is out. We can't get any point of view other than the fact. And we're now sending, you know, more billions, which we can ill spare because it's borrowed. We borrow it and we send it there. Have you seen the cars in the, with the Ukrainian number plates in Monaco? They're to die for. Ferraris, Mercedes, Rolls Royces. Um, st- still, the, the, the press, and I'll leave, leave you for the final comment on this. Of course, the big problem we have in a so-called democracy, in a so-called free society, we do not have a free press. We haven't had a free press now for decades. So there's nobody calling it out. It's the government rule. It's support the government. The editorials, even in prestigious, the Spectator, uh, the uh, the Economist, the Daily Telegraph over here, what used to be prestige publications, it support the government, whoever the government of the day is, the BBC, just to support the government of the day. Uh, and so consequently, nobody's calling it out. People now have stopped watching the news. Very few people here actually turn on the BBC news. Uh, they probably get the social media, they go on social media, or they have lost complete interest in the government of their country completely. They're just living lives of quiet desperation, um, uh, but they're, they're ill-informed. Most, And here's just a finish, sorry, I'm rambling on about this, but it's always exciting to talk to you. Um, the one class here who don't do that is what we call would call the artisan class. Your your chippy, your 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 uh, carpenter, and all these sort of people are far more informed and understanding about what's actually happening to them than your middle class. Especially, of course, if your middle class work for the government, and we have six million people working for the government at the moment. Unbelievable. That's more than we had when we had the biggest empire the world's ever seen. So, and they're protected. Index linked pensions, index linked salary, and all the rest of it, unsackable. So we've got half, half the population here aren't getting this, you know, this this inflation business. It's not happening to them. It's happening to your ordinary family uh, who aren't working for the public sector. I suspect it's very similar in the United States. Well, it is, but I don't think we have as many public sector workers. But uh, yeah, I mean, Janet Yellen, I, 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 she is just tone deaf, absolutely tone deaf. A couple of years ago, she said, yes, we'll never see another financial crisis in my lifetime. So maybe she was planning on dying pretty quick. 
but also just recently, right? We're getting these reports out and she's like, oh yeah, the economy is just humming right along. I don't know why the average person doesn't understand that we have control of inflation. I mean, she is tone deaf. And what that ultimately leads to is revolution. That's what it always ultimately, if, uh, when they're tone deaf enough and the pain gets big enough, you know, even though the, the people that work for the government are protected, what happens when you enter a hyperinflationary stage? You can look everybody, at- Everybody, yeah, exactly. everybody gets burned, yeah. Exactly. Everybody gets burned and it doesn't matter who you work for and it doesn't matter how many of these you have or even of these monopoly money, right? What's the difference? Somebody will work for that one and they won't work for that one. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is this is the end of the currency's life cycle. The debt is not just unsustainable. It's been unsustainable for a very long time. It is, now, it is also unpayable. So when you know that you are not going to repay this debt, and you get a new, I go back to this, you get a new credit card in the mail, most people will go out and spend that, take on that debt because they know that tomorrow that debt's going to be gone. And I think when they declare bankruptcy, and I think that's what we're seeing here now in the corporations, with the governments, as well as the individuals. I mean, how? you know, with governments, they can keep printing until they can keep printing, period. And that's what ends up happening because really they have no other tools. And, and we're at the end. That's it. You better have your physical gold, your physical silver, but you also better be able to create security with food, water, energy, security itself, barterability, which for me is silver, Wealth preservation, which for me is gold, community has become definitely the most important thing because we don't have the luxury of time anymore. And most people, I'm not so sure in the UK, but I can tell you in the US, most people have enough food in their pantries for three days. And most grocery stores have food in storage for three days. So what happens after the sixth day? And in 2020, that was just a big test. Do people even remember that they think that it's over? Because the other part that happens inside of a crisis is people panic. And then when they print money or they do whatever, the governments, the central banks, and kind of calm that down, just like what, a month ago with the global markets imploding, and now it's gone. The yen carry trade magically reversed itself. Every, nothing to see here, folks. Just go away. You know, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Well, we need to look at the man behind the curtain. We need to look at ourselves. We need to take personal responsibility and we need to come together in local community to ensure that you can have security in all those mantra areas because you cannot live without food and you cannot live without water. What are you doing personally to ensure that? And then globally, because if we do not come together on a global basis and create the sound money movement, and we do that really simply, quietly, peacefully, by converting this garbage mm, mm, mm. value that's used in one place into sound money that is globally accepted and used in every single sector of the global economy. This is your bazooka to go into this currency life cycle issue. I don't care how high the stock market goes because frankly, a trillion times zero is still zero. And it's easy to transfer that wealth away when you don't see what's coming. I'm working so hard, you're working so hard to open people's eyes because ignorance doesn't make anybody immune. It just leaves them vulnerable. And frankly, that's not okay with me.
And, it, and it, it's really interesting because we've got to create a global sound money movement. Okay, good, in one country or this country or that country, but we are all people of the planet. And we need to come together on a global basis to say, nope, you cannot stuff those CBDCs, that full control surveillance economy. We will not accept it. And the only way you do that is to have real money outside of the system that becomes invisible. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, I've been preaching it over here. I've got uh, six weeks food supply. Uh, in uh, We live in a small community, in a small rural community. But yeah, uh, we've got, got all that. And of course, we're still at the stage here where people are laughing at me a bit, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, I'll be selling them some tin pies at a vastly inflated rate if they're not careful and they're desperate and they're hungry. Anyway, leaving that aside, Lynette, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And I do hope that uh, if you come to England, we can meet up wherever you are and whatever you're doing here, um, uh, especially if it's anywhere near Yorkshire or London. Of course, I go to London by and by. So, you know, we can meet up. That would be good. We will definitely be doing that. I, I think we, we haven't really set it up yet, but we have begun to talk about it. So uh, I do believe that that will most likely happen next November sometime. Sure, sure. Okay, well, as I say, if I, if, if I can help in any way, uh, I'm, I'm being very happy to. Well, I'd love to come to your neck of the woods. Well, I, just, I, I like it. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, Lynette. And... Uh, and speak to you again soon, I'm sure. I hope so. Take care, Godfrey. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research-based, uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it, because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful, and then, of course, I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so... Surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.